And hello everyone. You're very welcome. You're very welcome to Kitchen Power National Parallels, an online international symposium delivered in partnership between the National Museum of Ireland Country Life and the National College of Art and Design and supported by Design History Society Virtual Event Grant. Uh, my name is Noel Campbell. I am a curator here in the National Museum of Ireland Country Life and co-curator with Dr. Sosha O'Brien uh, of, of our exhibition, Kitchen Power, Women's Experiences of Rural Electrification here in Turley Park, County Mayo. Over the four sessions run today and tomorrow, our impressive panel of speakers will look at the parallels and differences between mid-century modern kitchens in national contexts from Ireland to Spain, Scandinavia, Canada and South Korea. Our speakers over the four sessions are Dr. Fridi Flore, KU Leuven, Dr. Ana Maria Fernandez Garcia, University of Oviedo, Dr. Sophie Gerber, Technicia Museum, Vienne, Maria Goren's daughter, Omeo Institute of Design, Dr. Yuna Lee, University of Brighton, Dr. Sorcia O'Brien, NCAD, Professor Barbara Penner, Bartlett School of Architecture, and Professor Ruth Sandwell, University of Toronto. Uh, if you haven't done so and you'd like to register for this afternoon's session, that's Irish time and our two sessions tomorrow, you can still do so by searching for Kitchen Power National Parallels and clicking on the museum.ie link. And uh, it's a very easy process to register for tomorrow and this afternoon's session as well. So in our first session this morning, Dr. Sorsha O'Brien and Dr. Yuna Lee will look at issues about modernity and domesticity in Ireland and South Korea. You can put questions to our two speakers uh, by clicking on the Q&A box, which should be at the bottom of your screen. And following the second presentation, we'll do our best to have as many of those questions uh, answered as possible. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Sorsha O'Brien, who will discuss kitchen power, modernity, tradition and gender roles during Irish rural electrification. Okay. Thank you, Noel, um, for that introduction. And thank you to everybody for coming along virtually today. Um, what I wanted to talk about was some of the research that I had done working in Kingston University when I had a AHRC um, leadership fellowship and which formed the basis of the Kitchen Power exhibition as Noel's just, just mentioned. And the idea behind this and how this led into this symposium is basically looking at the same sort of issues that I was interested in in an Irish context and looking at how does, do these actually work in a number of other national contexts. So looking at in, you know, things like uh, gender roles, domesticity, consumerism, um, electrification and technology and national identity, how do they all intertwine? Um, and what I'm going to look at today particularly is the Irish context and the particular blend of modernity and tradition that played out in Ireland and how that was sold to rural Irish women in the 1950s and 1960s, particularly before the arrival of second wave feminism in the 1970s, which is when it arrived in Ireland. So this next slide. Um, a small bit of background to Ireland at the time is that you have, this is the Irish Republic, which had been declared in 1949. So I'm going to talk about the 1950s and the 1960s, where you're looking at a post-colonial country with a weak, largely agricultural economy and a move during this time period from protectionist economic policies towards free trade in the 1950s. So starting to bring in direct foreign investment, although you don't have the Republic joining the EEC until 1973 at the same time as the United Kingdom and living standards dramatically improving then. But you also have a country that's heavily influenced by the Catholic hierarchy and the constitution of 1937 had explicitly framed women's contribution to society as being surrounding their life within the home. Um, the marriage bar and a, a ban on contraception and abortion meant that you have a society with large families, very little prospects outside of marriage for young women who were subsequently emigrating to the UK and the USA, particularly in large numbers. 
And one of the aims of the rural electrification campaign of the 1950s and early 1960s was to make more rural life more attractive to these young women. So rather than having looking forward to a life of drudgery, which is a term that comes up repeatedly in the media at the time when talking about domestic life. And from the late 1940s all the way through to the mid 1960s, the Electricity Supply Board, the ESB, was the semi-state organisation that was the electrical utility, but also was um, selling electrical appliances and then running this rural electrification scheme. So in this context, what I wanted to talk about briefly was the anthropologist Clifford Geertz's ideas about the formation of new post-colonial nations, I've taken this quote out from his book, The Interpretation of Cultures. And he talks about the way in which national identity of a new state tries to balance itself between, on the one hand, the tides of the present, and then its inherited course. And he uses these terms essentialism and epochalism to describe these two impulses. And this is a, a set of ideas I found particularly useful as a design historian, looking at the material transformations of social structures, such as how the changes in the rural kitchen during this time period re both reflected and shaped the lived experience of women's lives. Um, so the traditional way of life in Ireland was still very evident in the 1950s. This is an image from the collection of the National Museum of Ireland Country Life and the museum itself documents a way of life that hadn't much changed in a, the past, the previous hundred years. And this thatched cottage in Menlo and Galway was surveyed in 1945. And you've got quite a lot of people still living in situations like this, where it's laid out around an open central hearth with cooking, eating, socializing, taking place in one room in front of the hearth. And then in this case, there's a single bedroom behind. And if you look at the top left-hand corner, there's a, a sketch of that hearth furnished with iron pots, both hanging and then sitting in the turf fire surrounded by movable furniture such as chairs and creepy stools and benches with also larger pieces of furniture than things like tables or the the iconic dresser occupying more fixed positions and in contrast to this very traditional way of life you're looking at the influence of the modern movement and scientific rationalism on design and on interiors so on the left here we have christine frederick's very well-known diagram of it's an efficient grouping of kitchen equipment, rationalizing the layout of a kitchen based on the steps taken by the housewife. And on the right, then the Frankfurt kitchen, which is generally known as the forerunner of the modern fitted kitchen. Um, these kitchen designs are very much based on ideas about efficiency and rationality, making use of new materials and so on. And these were mostly brought into Ireland by a small number of architects in the decades from the 1920s onwards, with mostly architects own houses and individual housing commissions. Although you do start to see them in the 1960s in women's magazines and these sort of ideas, they start circulating in the 50s and into the 60s. And when I actually started doing the research for this, what I had found documented in actual Irish rural kitchens from this time period was a hybrid of these two approaches, although balanced much further over towards the essentialist traditional end of the spectrum until you hit the 1970s when there's a wave of self-build bungalows constructed influenced by a particular one a book of plan, house plans called bungalow bliss written by jack fitzsimmons and what you have here are generally older buildings with the continued layout and emphasis on the hearth but with new apply electrical appliances added to them you pretty much mostly freestanding and mixed in with traditional furniture so the example on the right here in Lickettstown in County Kilkenny has the electrical cooker, but also then the traditional settle and the other hybrid form, which is the electric sacred heart lamp at the top. And personally, or partly, I think that this lack of radical change is largely through to or due to the poor economic situation of the country at the time where the sheer lack of money meant that most people couldn't afford renovations or new houses until the 1970s. 
And this chart from the 1970 ESB annual report gives you an idea of the market penetration of the six main appliances in Ireland. And we you only have electric irons hitting over 50% ownership. And I think this is largely because of the relative expense of the larger appliances, such as fridges and washing machines, compared to things like irons and kettles. But indeed, we part of the oral history project that we, the oral history recordings that we did for the project, that several of the women we interviewed mentioned buying larger appliances with inheritances or with gifts of money from family, usually older female relatives. And looking at the cookers, the electric cooker here is actually on the left is looking at 30% ownership of the, popul the population, which is still quite low. But partly this one is explained by competition from other forms of cookers. So you still have households that are cooking over open turf fires into the 1970s. Uh, households with bottled gas cookers over on the right hand side from the Cozen gas or the Keller gas. And then in the centre, the solid fuel range, particularly in more affluent households. And there's, you can see particularly in the newspapers and the um, advertisements at the time, there's an ongoing back and forth between electricity and gas um, as to which is better. And what you do have is these sort of hybrid strategies again and uh, of use where there's maybe electric appliances, a gas cooker, things mixed in together. But also as well, one of the things that came up in the oral histories, and which was also photographed by the keeper of the National Museum, Country Life, Claudia Doyle, as part of her research in 1999, was this traditional pot oven or bastable, which is normally wood is iron and would normally have been set into the coals or the, the turf of a fire to bake bread. And in this case, you'd found this being used with the little legs cut off, being used in an electric oven as the, the woman who was doing this felt that it was the bread cooked better in the pot oven, but that the electric oven actually gave consistent heat. So all these sort of strategies of people are trying to adapt from one way of cooking to another um, and or, or not as the case may be. Um, and the aim of the rural electrification program then was not just to install electricity in every house in the state, but also to develop Irish people and particularly Irish women as electrical consumers. And the two images here represent the two big images or the two big issues that were playing against each other in the choice of, to buy an electrical appliance. So on the one hand you have the left the desire to reduce the amount of drudgery endured daily by housewives but then over on the right hand side is the real concerns about cost and about money and how the bill would be paid a monthly bill particularly if you're talking with a lot of people on a regular farm incomes. And a lot, number of ESB promotions centred around the idea of the unit and the electrical unit, measuring out exactly how much hot water or ironing or fridge cooling you could get for this unit of electricity with this, this cartoon character aiming to make it more friendly. And indeed, one of the early TV advertisements was encouraging that if your bill is bigger, you know you're living better. Uh, rather than being necessarily thrifty. Um, and the advertisements used both by the ESB and by appliance manufacturers echoed these sort of strategies. So there's a lot of time about money. There's a lot of material about um, being thrifty. And there's a lot of, but there's also an awful lot of material about hygiene and cleanliness, which is something that I think is a set of meanings about electricity that are fairly international. Um, you don't see a lot of the sort of magical references that you see in other European countries, but it's a very serious and quite restrictive model of heterosexual femininity as the, the female role model. And particularly as well as this idea of gas being seen as dirty. Um, and then you have the, the 
ad on the right hand side which is aimed at the husband which is which man's wife has the electric cooker he's the one who can sit there and you know stand and read the newspaper and doesn't have to worry about re continually repainting the kitchen from the and the insinuation here is that he is a gas cooker and it's dirty so I want to talk a little bit then about the two groups of women who are organized outside of the home within this culture. Uh, the first of which were working for the ESB as what were known as lady demonstrators. And they were modeled on British appliance demonstrators and carried out both public demonstrations um, and think, ran th were involved in running things like schools bread baking competition here on the left but also as well did post sales visits to the homes of women who had bought large appliances from the ESB. Uh, supposedly to check that, say for example, the cooker was working, but from talking to the demonstrators the, recently, it was just as much about making sure that the woman was comfortable with the equipment and with the technology as making sure that it was the, the cooker was actually working. And, these demonstrators were generally in their 20s, because quite a lot of them left because of the marriage bar, uh, with third level education, as well as technical training from the ESB. And their level of comfort with electricity in the domestic realm made them important mediators for a lot of women, particularly women who might be intimidated by the culture of male expertise um, and the engineer. So the, and they definitely functioned as role models. Again, performing the sort of specific model of Irish femininity that's glamorous, but also very competent and sort of conscious of money and conscious of um, hygiene as well. And on the other hand, then there's the Irish Country Women's Association, which is a much larger organization and a much more average demographic of rural women. And basically, it's, it would be similar to some of the housewives organizations in other countries. But it's a very, very flat organization organized on local guild structure and very avowedly at, at this time, not feminist. Um, but they were still a very important force in promoting acceptance of electricity and modernity amongst their members. Um, and they're presenting a type of maternal feminism. I think rather than anything else. And because they're looking at strategies, things like when we interviewed Mamo McDonald, who's a, a past president of the association, she recollected that younger women were encouraged not to marry a farmer unless he promised to put electricity and running water into the farmhouse. So they're looking at all these sorts of soft, soft power strategies to try and make their lives better. And they also demonstrated the sort of balancing of essentialism and epochalism in their demonstration kitchen here, which was built in 1963, which combined a modern Formica layout on the one hand with electrical appliances. And, but also then at the back of the room, there's a, a white painted hearth flanked by a settle and then sort of a modernist approximation of a country dresser with the shelves on the left hand side just being used to display um, ceramics and precious objects with the, the, the bench underneath it. And it's very purposefully and very consciously combining, as it says on the top there, old world charm and modern amenities, implying that it's entirely possible to do, have both. And this idea was all, had also been pushed by a collaboration between the ESB and the ICA in the 1950s in a farm kitchen designed for the yearly agricultural show in Dublin, the Spring Show, which ran in the, the RDS, the Royal Dublin Society. And this farm kitchen was designed by a female architect, Eleanor Butler, who had worked for the ICA and had been sent on a study tour of Northern Europe by them. And so she's very much immersed in these ideas about efficiency and about rationality and worked on adapting a traditional farm kitchen along modern lines with an efficient zoned layout and then built in electrical appliances. And you can see the plan down on the bottom right hand corner there where it's zoned into cooking areas. There's living space and there's scullery over on the left hand side for the, the, the laundry and the wet 
tasks. And this kitchen was really popular at the show and it was so popular that once the show was finished, it was actually installed into a mobile van that was, the ESB drove around the country for several years giving demonstrations. And it's also part of the kitchen that we re did a reconstruction of in the Kitchen Power exhibition. But the whole thing about this is that you're talking about this one case is 1956 and it remained aspirational rather than any sort of reality until you hit this building boom in the 1970s where you start to get fitted kitchens built from these standardized plans. And my last example then is a later ESB model kitchen which ran at the same agricultural show in 1966 um, which is explicitly presented within a, a thatch cottage and I'm going to play part of this for you now. Okay, I've just been, I'm not sure whether everybody can actually, I'm not sure if everyone can actually hear the sound on that or not, or not, but this is a promotional film narrated by Francis Condell, who was the mayor of Limerick at the time, and picks up on a number of the themes where it's talking about a, a combination of a white-walled traditional kitchen with modern appliances and very much positioning it in between, halfway between tradition and modernity. And talking about the layout of the kitchen that it is purposefully laid out to reduce the number of steps that the uh, housewife have to, has to take. Making the point that, you know, an average day, a housewife would uh, take more steps than somebody playing an All-Ireland final in um, Gaelic football. And, but it's very much, specifically talking directly to women about progress and talking about how the you know you don't have to clean the dirt from the the oil lamps anymore that you've got this lovely you know lovely clean kitchen so it's picking up on all of these ideas talking about to women about progress but very much within this domestic context and this is very much where I've been going with this is this idea of having that there's this balance between essentialism and epochalism that's going on within Ireland but that it's being negotiated in a very spe specific way to that country that using based on the traditional approaches traditional ways of life but then looking at how can you actually negotiate ideas about hygiene and modernity into a specifically Irish context. Um, so thank you, that's it um, with contact details and all there. This is the exhibition that's open in Mayo in 
um, the National Museum of Ireland at the time. So cool. Thank you. Back to Noel. Thank you, Sorsha. Thank you very much for that. It certainly brings back uh, a lot of memory of developing that uh, Kitchen Power exhibition with you. Uh, I should add, actually, that the Kitchen Power uh, web pages are, are now live on museum.ie, so feel free to uh, to browse the exhibition, I suppose, virtually in the, in the times we're in. That's uh, only what a lot of us can do at this stage. But they are there and uh, a lot of information and they will be updated as well over the coming days as well to add more of the exhibition um, onto museum.ie. Um, I see we have questions coming in, and, but I am keen to leave time at the end so that we can um, uh, put those questions to both Sorja and uh, Yuna. But I will introduce our second speaker now, who is Dr. Yuna Lee. And Dr. Uh, Yuna Lee will be uh, discussing modern kitchen design technology and gender in South Korea. Oh, can can you can you see me? Yes, we have your page there, Yenia. And can you see my screen as well? Yes. Okay. I can only see your screen now, which is great. Your your presentation is up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction, and then thank you very much to Sosha who invite me to this conference, and thank you to National Museum of Ireland in Maya putting such a wonderful exhibition which I actually haven't been able to uh, go and see yet and and I don't know if I'll be able to but I'll be following the exhibition through uh, online so hopefully my talk about modern kitchen design technology and gender in South Korea can contribute to that discussion happened in the exhibition So uh, this short a Korean film called Better Kitchen, which was filmed in 1959 and showcased how, uh, how to modernize traditional Korean kitchen. And so this improved the modern uh, kitchen is not only kind of showing the functional and efficient working space for cooking, but it's also uh, become as a symbol of modernity for the Koreans particularly who was living in the rural area. So this film is about 12, 12 minutes long and then it was, uh, it was produced by the Bureau of Public Information as an educational film. And so the whole thing is actually scripted and scenarioed. And so in this film, the, there are three people who, the couple who is actually living in this rural house with a kind of quite old, old fashioned, Kind of a house in an old-fashioned kitchen and then home economist who is this young woman you can see on the screen on the left bottom and visit to this couple's house and discuss how to improve their kitchen as a you know, to the better kitchen so uh, here and then she shows the plan for the better kitchen and explains how the new equipment is going to work when, within their kind of a kitchen and particularly uh, the focus is on actually kind of improving that that cooking furnace actually we can see it on the top uh, left screen and then also kind of making this kind of a, a kind of a working tables and sink with a very basic kind of a water supply and then uh, plumbing actually built into that so she also demonstrates this, uh, how to make these things. You can see on the right hand side, and then she showed all the kind of uh, graphics and diagrams and, and then you know, booklet, which is, you can see on the left, left hand side bottom. And when you actually look at this, actually, so the, this home economist who's actually improving this kitchen is dressed in a very kind of modest, simple dress in a Western style. In contrast to the, uh, the housewife who is dressed in hanbo, which is Korean dress, uh, which, uh, with the aprons around her waist. Then the husband uh, is wearing workman's clothing in Western style. So here we can see this familiar association of appearances and clothing to the modern and tradition is very well kind of established here as well. 
So the drawings and plans of a home economist, this, uh, economist shows the couple also represents technology and efficiency and hygienic and cleanness through the kind of forms of this scientific rational forms of knowledge. So as Asosha was discussed and the, the kind of a, the history, sorry, I'll go back again. So the much of the history of the modern kitchen has been already in the, the kind of a written and then kind of narratives of actually how those stories actually kind of unfolds, we actually come to know very, very well. So studies of kind of Korean modern kids in, in the 20th century, particularly coming after from about 1930s and then, and then it kind of propelled after 19, uh, late 1950s. And it kind of follows this kind of a trajectory of uh, modern kitchen narratives and with a slight kind of a uh, time lag and as things were actually happening in a different, uh, different time frame. And, but also we know that actually there are, there are variations in how we, uh, how these kind of uh, developments is happening and negotiated in different countries and different nations. So the Korean kitchen, uh, Korean kitchen is really very much actually, the, by looking at the Korean kitchen, we can actually see how this kind of process of uh, modernization and then how people deal with modernity has actually been negotiated in particularly Korean context in 20th century. So below the surface of the kitchen cupboard, there are much of kind of encountering, crossing and negotiation of conditions and ideas of modernity. So here I found uh, what Judy Affield explained uh, what he meant by modernity in her book, Bringing Modernity Home, Rather Useful and Apt. So she was based on Barnum's broad definition of modernity and I feel defined the term modernity as the, the way in which consumers found ways of adopting to the challenging conditions of existing through consumption choices. So I, in, in this kind of, in, in terms of researching this, I was looking at photographs and advertisement of a kitchen and kitchen furnitures. Uh, through the kind of articles uh, shown in the uh, advertisement and articles are shown in the women's magazine mostly. So I was looking at three different women's magazine and, and then also uh, looking at some of the newspaper articles during 1960s and 70s. And so in this, uh, so uh, for the short period of time, I, I like to look at the ways in which the houses, kitchen space has been redefined and reconfigured in, uh, in the living space following this modern, modernization process. And then I'm going to look at particular cases of actually uh, sink and then stainless sink and also rice cooker. And then finally, I would like to think a little bit more about and how uh, the, the, uh, the how women responded to this specific aspect of modernity, which permeate to domestic space and interior. So just going through there kind of quickly some slide because I, you, you, you know, many of you may not familiar with the Korean kind of a house and you know what it looks like so this is a traditional korean house with the garden and then normally you know wells you know was located uh, kind of uh, in the garden or in the village as a water supply so you can see then the picture on the left hand side where the door is open is where the kitchen is and so in order to go to the kitchen you actually have to leave the kind of main rooms of the house and then and then enter the kitchen so kitchen was very much outside the space rather than kind of same space as the rooms uh, normally you occupy. And so traditionally kitchen inside here. So this is a photograph taken last day. It's just sort of like a village. Uh, it's a house uh, was re-erected and then kind of preserved in, in, an, in, an, in a traditional way. So you can see the, the old fashioned kind of furnace to cook the meal, which actually works as a, uh, heating for the rooms as well. So these, uh, the one of the first changes actually uh, brought in is a, uh, is a changing of the heating and cooking sources. So those uh, 
burning woods and through those furnaces then changed and replaced by this reformed brisket use of those briskets and then later on it was actually then replaced by gradually uh, gas and electricity but uh, brisket actually lasted a very long time in Korea until nearly the end of the 80s. So that was a kind of very big source of a kind of coal was a very big source of a fire. So the images you see here on the left hand side is very much actually kind of halfway of kitchen, which is still somewhat old fashioned, but you know, slightly modernized. And then, and then on the right hand side, there was an exhibition display of actually that it kind of a kind of reconstruction of a how that may have looked and worked. And all these changes were very much found together in the frame of a housing development in, in the uh, latter part of 20th century in Korea. So housing development happens in, in the 30s under the colonial rule. But after the uh, war, independence and Korean war, and then housing shortages become really quite uh, kind of a, uh, uh, acute and supplying the uh, modern house for the mass uh, population become a really big national kind of project. And so the modernization of a house is actually kind of uh, propelling the kind of looking at the kitchens again and then giving the frame to work with those kitchens. I'm really sorry actually, there might, you might be hearing this kind of bing 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 noise. I don't know how to turn it up. So just please ignore it. And so this, uh, this uh, kind of a diagram in the a woman's magazine called Year One, which actually looked at mostly for the 1960s period, shows the three different kind of uh, arrangement. So from the left top is the kind of traditional arrangement, and then the one below is kind of a, you know, the, the what's called actually the welfare house and the small house, kind of a new house project happened in about late 1950s and early 60s. And the right hand side, the big one is the one they are proposing as a kind of a modern house based on kind of traditional ideas of uh, housing in Korea. And so there is a, this discussion about actually how to organize the, the kind of home spaces and where the kitchen is going to be located within those spaces was continuously actually kind of uh, happening in the uh, magazines actually pages throughout from their time in early 60s all the way to 1971 when, when they end. So modernized kitchen in, in 50s and 60s very much promoted by government bodies and also was promoted by women's magazine. And so women's magazine actually ran kind of a feature articles about showing different houses and you know, well-known persons or middle classes interiors. So this is one of those series called My Dress Food and House. So they actually ran this through 1963 and, uh, 63 and 64. And so this woman, she is a uh, Cheokja is a uh, she is the the, the head of actually uh, school women's school. So in the presentation here, she's wearing very much actually traditional dress, and and her in the middle bit is where it shows her kitchen, which is you can see is kind of below the level through the doors little window. And then you see the, the kind of cupboard she's having and also she has a, a, like a table where she uses it as a dining table. And then on the left hand side is actually her kind of clothing session. So, so she's actually hand sewing her, her clothes. So in, on an appearance actually, this is actually looking quite kind of a traditional setup and then the kitchen is you know, very much actually in a, in a traditional way. But what she talks about her food and what kind of food she eats in the mornings. And it's very much actually non-traditional. So she's not actually in Korean traditional meal, you will, you will expect it to have a three, three meals with all the rice and all the soups and trimmings. And, but she's actually kind of very much actually kind of simplified those things. And then she's replacing some of the meals with the bread and the, the, the fruits. So, you know, in terms of actually kind of visual cues, it might be quite, 
uh, kind of a kind of it it does look rather non mod I mean like a less modern but actually in her way of living actually she's really rather modern woman at the time and another uh, dress of food house shows this house uh, the couple who lives in an apartment so apartment living is become very uh, much actually something to be discussed. There's a very new and very modern living space because it, it is a you know it is a it is bringing all those kind of a changes in terms of infrastructures and then kind of a, the 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 supply of all those different kind of areas in the rooms in a very different way and it's also kind of a different way of living so it's a, you know, a lot of households living in the same building together so this has become a you know kind of focus of discussion for many years and then of course now korea is you know very very kind of a you know it's, it's covered with apartments everywhere in the land so this is uh, very much actually this uh, this woman and uh, she is a uh, the painter. So so the whole article is actually written in a way actually how they are much um, their their way of living is a slightly more kind of Western modern way. So she much prefer uh, sitting on a chair, and um, because you know sitting down on the floor is actually quite difficult to get up, so it make you lazy. That's what she said. And her kitchen is but you know her kitchen is actually because it's quite small apartment it's actually very basic and then compared to the previous cases actually this is much more cramped and and then quite difficult to work with less work surface around so the uh, the year one women's magazine is actually peppered with this kind of a, kind of a images and articles so there's a house visits been featured several times in in many issues so these are the you know some of the examples so this is actually two women I mean two cases I think they are very you know they live in a very big house and then they their husbands actually are very well established in the their and then they're quite well off and kind of a middle class or, or upper middle class so here we can see uh, the, uh, the kitchen organized in such ways with all the cabinets and then draining and sink and then and then cooking areas all been lined up so it's kind of a that working thinking about the uh, the kind of efficiency of working in the kitchen is very much considered in in the build of this kitchen and then the the, the far left image is uh, as in a particular mentioned in the article and saying actually this was built based on looking at several different uh, kind of uh, uh, manuals and then plans and it was built as a sort of like a you know, kind of put together so you can actually dismantle it in three pieces so this is a kind of one of the first things mentioned in a way so this is something to be kind of kind of built together and then actually dismantled again and used again kind of way and <laughs> And then, you know, uh, the, uh, this is another image of uh, those kind of different kind of kitchen they were showing in, in people's houses. So those two, these two cases were, the left one is the architect's drawing and on the right hand side is actually really showing the dining kitchen within the kitchen, you know, dining kind of tables within the kitchen. So it's called the dining kitchen. So the article is written about actually how to organize the kitchen space and those articles does talk about uh, scientific management and efficiency and ergonomic concerns and in terms of the designing kitchen space and cabinets and then equipment and, and appliances but it does also talk about kitchen and where the kitchen should be positioned and so kitchens often positioned together with the like a bathroom and where you can kind of have a drainage waters together but also it does actually tend to have position in the north actually in korean kind of a, a feng shui actually kind of a principles and 
And, but it also does talk about kitchen as a kind of central place in the house. And then, you know, uh, people's, uh, many house members activities can overlap in the kitchen. So this is actually where in, in the like late sixties where they really start talking about kitchen being as a part of actually other house members spaces as well as actually the housewife space. So the the kitchen areas been because it's kind of incorporated into the living spaces and shared by other members. So appearance of the kitchen become very important and how it looks. And so here is an example of actually how the the company who actually developed uh, the sink, which is a you know, drainage and sink hall. And then, then they expand their business into those uh, kitchen uh, cabinets. And then, so for, for a while, actually, the sink is actually kind of a, almost a kind of synonym is the same as like a, this kind of uh, the block kitchen. So this is the advertisement for the uh, Audi Pure sink, which is actually duck. And so, so there's a lot of actually kind of a, a uh, the kind of uh, the water lit related animals names used for the sink uh, brand. So duck is one, and then there is a there is a tortoise, and then there was a swan, and uh, several other names as well. And but in the image here, you can see that and um, the 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 kind of uniformity is applied to the the design of the kitchen units. And also it kind of gives the spaces where you can display your appliances. So you can see that actually rice cook in the corner on, on, on the left hand side images and juice mixers and then and then airport. And then there's also areas where you can show your kind of crockery and then you know, the uh, glasses and so on. So sink itself is a uh, stainless steel and it's replacing the uh, mostly kind of wooden kind of sink or, or tired sink. So this is completely new material which actually brought in it in the kitchen as a, uh, the, a, the, it's a high tech, it's a clean, it's, a, it's also, it's a very refined, that's actually the word they're using, it's a refined material. And so, and, and then they actually kind of push that into really quite to the far end. So this is the kind of a sink they developed for the 1981, where actually their kind of popularity start weighing a bit. So this sink uh, is completely uh, stainless sink and with a bit of pattern, patinated door. And it does also show the kind of uh, inside arrangement uh, in the cupboard. So the, the, the text in, in here does talk about and, you know, the, the longevity of this, uh, this materials in design and how efficient and how uh, functional these designs are, also how kind of sophisticated and then refined these design is. Hmm, I wonder. And um, so these are uh, uh, the the women's magazine at Jubu Senghuao and ran this series called the Sweet Home and in there they call it our kitchen where work is a joy. So this is the this is where the the the, the kind of uh, the happiness and enjoyment is actually kind of uh, come to attached with actually working in the kitchen and then kitchen area. And so, uh, so this, uh, uh, this particular article, which ran in 1975, then uh, the following issue is actually particularly then the, in the same title, it has been supported by uh, the Audi the Pure Sink. sink. So, so Sink uh, Company, Audi Pure Sink, is actually using this particular series as a kind of platform to advertise their own sink brand and then here they actually also in the image on the right hand side they they particularly kind of promoting their uh, kind of K mark which is 
which actually represent and and how much of the kind of the export they achieved, which is another way of actually kind of a saying it's a really, really good brand of and good quality kitchen. And those arrangements uh, is uh, leading to this uh, company called the Hansen Kitchen, and then which is one of the biggest company in Korea in terms of a kitchen design. And so the uh, the kitchen uh, they started from our list uh, 1971, and then and then and developed this uh, kind of series of actually the kind of a designed uh, kitchen furniture. So they're not really focusing on only the kitchen sink and, and then they really see the kitchen as a kind of a part of an interior. And that was their idea to push forward and promote kitchen as a, as a kind of interior business. So then so they, on the left hand side there, you can see the woman, the young kind of a, a vibrant woman who is again, you know, very much actually standing in the proudly and happily in her kitchen and showing the what is actually what you can have if you have a uh, hands-in kitchen and and then they then developed this is the call you know they call it as a system kitchen later on in 1981 where they also integrate their all these other appliances and other kind of uh, equipment within those kitchen and and then they they use they call that particular kitchen model as a euro. So the the Hansem's uh, kitchen uh, all from seventies, all of their uh, their their new products actually has a very much European uh, name. So they are all you know English sounding names. So they're very much signalling this is uh, it's is actually related to somewhere outside of Korea and, and, and then particularly locating in Europe. And so this is, that's where actually kind of a, the European kind of a modern kitchen idea of modernism is, is very much actually formally and visually been embraced and then, then replicated in, in, in a different ways in the Korean kitchen. And then sometimes it's very, very similar and it's very difficult to tell the differences. But if you look at the bottom where the text is, text is very actually technical. So it does actually kind of talk about the height of the worktop and, and then it does talk about, you know, all the technical and uh, information about what they, why they actually kind of a good, a good kitchen company. So, so the, the image is always been a kind of a accompanied with this, uh, uh, the kind of detail, the technical information about kitchen. And so this is the kind of a, the, quite a lot of a, uh, the articles kind of shows this kind of a, you know, areas of where, you know, where you can, you know, the, you, where you can actually have these shelves for the pots and then and lots of uh, the condiments which Koreans have a lot of them. And then those ideas very much observed into Hansen's actually system kitchen. So that's where Hansen is actually really very cleverly making those uh, very uh, kind of a personal, per, kind of a, the, the personalized into the Koreans taste and Koreans use of, use of actually kitchen spaces in terms of stories. Mm -hmm. And so they have a rice container, which is a really important part of actually the kitchen in Korea, and used to be. And then they also have this uh, the storage case where you can actually have lots of different condiments. And so those uh, kitchen design is also, we can see that the a lot of uh, appliances actually appearing in, in within those kitchen so electric uh, appliances kitchen appliances start growing and in korean uh, kind of a, uh, consumer products market and so electricity has been uh, this uh, the, has been uh, supplied to the public and since uh, 
early 20, I mean, late 19th century, but the, it, it has not been widely uh, kind of uh, supplied to the public until about early 1960s. And it was only 1964 when actually the, the Korean electric, uh, electric Corporation set up and they managed to actually kind of uh, uh, the supply most of the household by then. So with those uh, growing elec electricity supply and then electric appliances actually also taken up as a consumer product. So on the left hand side, the gold star was now actually called LG is actually kind of showcasing, laying out their kind of different kind of appliances. In 1966, uh, interestingly, they don't actually have rice cooker in there. But in 1965, in Year One magazine, actually does show the rice cooker as a, one of the must, you know, one of the things you must have in the house. And then, and it does say actually this woman who had a rice cooker does say the rice cooker is so healthy because uh, she's so lazy, she can't actually get up and cook the rice in the morning. So you can actually just press the button and then the rice is going to be cooked. So that's where the kind of a, you know, con con convenience of actually the rice cookers come through, but still very much actually cooking breakfast is a woman's work altogether. So rice cooker is firmly what house, uh, housewife and mothers, uh, uh, mothers actually are you know, using. And so these images here on the left hand side, so like a rice cooker and then gold star advertisements of the rice cooker and other electric kind of appliances shows actually the role of mother in terms of actually kind of providing the rice, which is the very important and the ingredient in Korean meal. And also what is very important is actually this is not just about rice cooker, but also is a rice warmer. So in Koreans, uh, Koreans because they we they use them, they tend to have meals in, all day. So keeping the uh, rather than cooking rice every meal and then keeping it warm all day long or maybe two days become a, such a kind of a so saving of actually all the chores and labors. And so that's why it was actually very much actually been praised and widely widely kind of used in the household. And so left side, left hand side is a cooker, and then and uh, the Korean scholar who studied about the design of those cookers, and so you can see the cooker itself is actually resembles more of the shape of the pot, and then warmer is actually kind of a, have a much more rectangular shape, and also it does have a kind of plastic casing with the decorative design on top of it. So this is another case of a Mama Electric rice warmer. This is the one actually, and um, it's a cooker and warmer. So you don't actually have to move. So normally you would cook rice in the rice cooker, then you will actually then move that into the warmer in order to uh, keep it warm. So you, for this module, you don't have to do that. It does all for you. So it does actually say how efficient, it, it, how energy efficient it is and how, you know, how much actually easy to use and how much actually nice meals you can have. But there has been quite a number of reports in the newspapers about how, how often that those actually rice cookers are not working. And there's a number of problems with this rice cookers and kitchen appliances. And, and then just the trawling through many of the, those kind of newspaper articles actually kind of reveals that the, there hasn't been a kind of much of regulation. There wasn't much of the regulation in terms of actually who is the kind of licensed, the kind of uh, rice cooker manufacturers and then the retailers. So there has been quite a lot of pirate kind of products and illegal products being circulated around in the retail market, which actually caused lots and lots of a uh, problem. And, and so because of that, and there are some of the reports is actually kind of shows about in 1976, for example, newspaper reports about Korean Housewives Wives Association holding an educational exhibition about household electric products. So here actually they kind of give uh, information about actually what to look out for in order to choose the right product. And then all the kind of a details about list of things you need to check when you wanted to kind of making sure your rice cooker is the right thing and it works good. 
And one of the actually kind of the things about looking out for the kind of a KS mark, which is a Korean standard mark, is one of those. And then also it kind of give, it does give also in instructions about how to keep it, uh, kind of how to look after it and how to clean it. And so it uh, there has, there is a quite lots of those kind of informations that the, as a housewife in order to observe and, and follow in order actually to, to purchase the, the right rice cooker, which was actually quite expensive purchase. So this means actually the women actually are actually having to get used to new knowledge and new kind of terms and new technology and new techniques actually in order to discern what is actually right products and wrong products, which is, which is, which is another kind of actually labor, intellectual labor actually as, a, as a new kind of woman and housewife to, to aspire to. And another interesting article showed in 1977 newspaper was actually how the rice cooker was actually become really popular in the rural area. And then this one uh, particularly does talk about and how rice cooker has been very uh, popular because it, it's cheaper to run it. Electricity is cheaper to actually to make the furnace fire. But also that means that the woman can go and work in the field. So it's economically actually beneficial. And so they're, they're kind of listing several different reasons, mostly economical reasons why rice cooker is actually a very good thing. But also they also point out and about 20% of a household in the rural area had a rice cooker. But when it become a farmers who actually has a big farm holding, they don't tend to use rice cookers very often in the busy season because biggest rice cooker, which actually has about 25 kind of portions is not big enough to the feed all the laborers during the day. So they rather use the traditional big iron pot and in order to supply all the, the meals for the laborers. So there is actually different ways of actually these uh, rural women who are actually using rice cookers in the ways actually it's suitable for their, for their circumstances and purposes. So in order to finish, so these are the kind of images promoting in terms of using uh, uh, the electronic uh, appliances. So the women's very much actually kind of consumer who is actually really enjoying the, these electric uh, appliances in the very leisurely setting, or even when she's working, she's actually very much actually smartly dressed, feminine and smiling. And then these are also represented in this uh, advertisements where women is talking about you know when you have these appliances uh, the, the kitchen work has become very happy and very convenient and then right inside the men only men appeared in the whole thing is actually talking about at after service so actually if you choose gold star products and it's guaranteed to have a good after service so he's the kind of uh, thinking about you know the, the structural kind of a process rather than happiness and so uh, in, in, a, um, in the last image here, I'm kind of looking at the, the kind of pr promotional images of women in this kitchen. But on the right hand side, this is a working woman who's, who was, a, who is a, who was a, a sign language translator. And in her reality, we can actually you know, in this image, we can probably glimpse the reality of a working mother's kitchen with the small children. So this is compared to the what is actually promoted on the left hand side is much more small, very limited spaces, very cluttered, very cramped with the uh, and and with the uh, children's. So going back to the what Paz was talking about, and 20th century kitchens were modern and as modern they were, it was momentary and cluster of design and, and technological, uh, the technological resolution, you know, as a kind of definitive what was contemporary, timely, so it was transit, uh, transitory. So women mostly discussed here were housewives 
and then they were modern by adapting to the uh, changing conditions of time with informed and educated consumer choices. But nevertheless, the modernity of a housewife in this modern kitchen is also bounded to the gendered notion of a space and labor and reaffirming women's place in the modern household at the kitchen counter as a master of the house management armed with modern knowledge of design and technology. So thank you. Thank you very much, Yuna. It's fascinating. Certainly a lot of differences and I'm sure a lot of our, our people watching would spot the be very familiar, I suppose, handsome kitchen for one. It looks very, very familiar, I'm sure, to a lot of people. Um, we do have some questions, so I'd like to get to those straight away and uh, we'll put them out to our speakers. So we have Claude Doyle, who is our keeper of Irish Folklife Division here at the National Museum of Ireland. So, let me see. Uh, thank you, Claude. Um, I think you can see these two, Sorshan. Would you like to take, I see Lisa Godson has a question, Sorsha, for yourself. Yeah, Lisa was asking where the 1966 cottage was that I was showing on the video at the end. And it wasn't actually a real cottage. It was uh, basically a, a set that was built for the 1966 RDS spring show. So it was part of the ESB stand on that at that agricultural show. And then that film clip was, you know, a way of promoting it and introducing it to the public. Um, but as far as I know, it was demolished afterwards once the spring show was over, as a lot of those um, shows where they'd put the stand up and then once the whole thing was taken apart, unless there was huge popularity, like the 1950s one, where it was kept and put in a van, generally they were just taken apart. Um, and maybe the appliances kept and sold, but um, they, start, they, they didn't actually survive other than in photographs or in videos. So. Um, and Second question, sir, for you. Yeah, Deborah Sogrian is asking about mm. the Hoosier Easy Work style cabinets found. They, I know that Deborah has done a, done research that they were quite. You got them a lot in certainly in England, but in Irish rural kitchens, it was very much about the traditional Irish dresser, and. I have seen examples of sort of who's your easy work cabinets in Ireland. I've, I didn't see any in any of the photographs that we got of from the 1950s or the 1960s, but there's been a, f a couple of them have shown up in like vintage stores or antique stores that I've seen, but a very, very small number. I, my sense and certainly the sen sense of, I think with the museum is that it's very much the traditional Irish dresser. Although one of the things about the traditional Irish dresser is that Claudia Kinmouth has done a lot of research on it, where it's very much their painted dressers rather than uh, stripped pine ones like you get in Scandinavia. And there's been certain, you know, there's been changes in fashion since then where the last sort of 20, 30 years, there's people, dealers going around Ireland trying to buy traditional dressers and then take the paint off them and strip them back to the wood, but they were generally not built from great quality wood to start with. And they were generally painted to match the interior of the room and repainted and often repainted repeatedly with like several layers of, you then the surviving ones have, you know, lots and lots of layers of paint on them. So they're quite, quite flexible from that point of view. So. You know, there's a question here for you. I'm yeah. wondering about the role of Korean women's magazines when did they begin and how distinctive are they in comparison to the ones we would know from Ireland and the UK? Mm. I mean, Korean women's magazine, in the sense of actually we understand that women's magazine in, in, a, in a kind of, in, a, in, in the Western world in graphic design history is uh, starting about 1920s in Korea, in the middle of 1920s. And then, then it, it kind of stops over the period when the Japanese war was happening, World War was happening in Japan, was actually kind of a more or less suppressed all the uh, kind of cultural activities within Korea. 
then it picked up later on from 1950s. So the magazine I referred a lot in the, my presentation called Yale One is the one of the first women's magazine and started after the independence and then the Second World War in starting from 1955. So those uh, magazines are very much actually the, the, the kind of a targeted for much of the educated middle class, very often housewives. So the titles were very much actually indicating the, these are the, the more kind of uh, the, the established middle class the housewife kind of a group of women they were dressing. So the contents were very much actually also about you know, house management and housing, managing chores in the, uh, what is a better way to, uh, you know, clean and things like that is also been uh, kind of discussed quite a lot, as well as actually the, ha because housing was a, such a big issue in 60s and, and all the way halfway through 70s, and there's a lot of articles written about housing. And then there are some articles, a uh, good, good number of articles written about fashion and dress. And, and also this is a period when the kind of new form of actually kind of dressing is actually coming into Korea. So there's a kind of number of articles written about uh, etiquettes and how to wear these things and how to sit when you wear short skirts and with long kind of, you know, exposing your legs and stuff like that. So, so that's also kind of bound up uh, in the ways actually how the women's been represented in Korea uh, in the, in the house and the kitchen. So I was actually kind of, when I was going through, it was really interesting because some women actually deliberately wearing traditional dress and then some women actually deliberately wearing Western style of dress. And, and, and when you're looking at the particular 50s and early 60s, there's actually kind of deliberate choices in terms of how they wanted to represent themselves. But then it kind of become more and more and more the kind of Western style of dress in line with actually the kind of interior itself. It become more and more kind of a modern, kind of a new kind of a style of actually kind of a life, lifestyle actually showing through in the interior too. Does it actually answer? Yeah, and I, one of the things just to add to that I thought was really interesting looking at your material unit is mm. the apron appearing. Mm. And it always seems to appear as the signifier of domesticity. Yeah. yeah. No yeah. matter what you're wearing, if you have the apron over it, it's your domestic. And then, then also those two kind of long dresses are actually home wares. So they're categorized, categorized as a, uh, the clothes you wear at home for working and to be decent while you're working. And it's, I don't know how you can wear long maxi dress actually then do some housework and who bring and cleaning. And, but that's actually what, it, what you know, a woman's supposed to wear. And also that was still until even I remember about until 20 years ago, people were getting married. And if you're getting married and as a new housewife, you will be buying some homeware as a kind of token of actually that kind of entering into that new phase of your life. So, I mean, it's completely gone now, but that was actually something that was actually uh, quite commonly recognized in from about mid, na, mid 1970s, uh, mid 70s till about to 1990s, I would say. Yeah, so it's very interesting how that bound up with the house, housework. We have another question in. What is interesting is that even though modernity is typically associated with progressive values, in these cases, modernized kitchens seem to have more conservative aims. Were they about preserving the family? How did second wave feminists respond to them? Who would like to pull uh, that one? So, I yeah. mean, in Ireland, my sense that the second wave feminists were concentrating on legal and political work rather than anything else. So they were looking at things like um, trying to repeal the marriage bar, for example, and trying to get access to contraception. Mm -hmm. um, the Irish Country Women's Association was involved with the Early Council for Women, but um, not a leading light of it. So they were, they seem to be, my impression is that they were, the second wave feminists were just more focused on getting the sort of legal structural things sorted out um, and not not thinking so much about kitchens and th that role of domesticity. Um, 
there is certainly there's also a housewives association that is much more middle class upper urban mm -hmm. um and everything that i've seen the material from them there's very little discussion about sort of like the servant problem or anything like that in ireland after about the 20s and the 30s that you're very much looking at the, you know the the decline of domestic help very early so there's there's not there's there isn't the same sort of discussion about emancipation there mm. as opposed to an awful lot of irish women who went to the uk who emigrated and were working in domestic service there but that's a whole other set of dynamics as well so not really i think is the answer what about korea um I would say actually it would be uh, it was actually quite a similar situation because uh, you know it's, it's still sixties and seventies. I, I mean even the feminists actually believed in the you know family values, and so quite often actually the this is kind of conservative. I mean this the educated and 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 the working women are also very much actually uphold of those family values of uh, of conservative uh, kind of a uh, kind of unis. So the, the feminism was working on, like you said, it's a framework and legal issues. So, you know, there's abortions and, and then also the, in Korea for a long time, women actually fought for the become a, the household, like a, the, the head of the household, because in Korea, the woman couldn't be a head of a household for a long, long, long time until nearly 21st century. So, you know that that kind of a legal kind of limitations women was facing was much more serious issues than actually thinking about family. So even uh, girl, I mean uh, even young women who was actually encouraged to go and find a job and work and then pursue the education and find the jobs in the universities or schools and quite often, and they are still being uh, expected to kind of find the right person and get married and by a certain time and then you are more or less expected to leave the company after you get married so you kind of gone back to the kind of house wife's position and then being in the house so so it has been you know that that uh, second wave of feminism uh i have to say actually it didn't actually come to korea in those periods and it it is coming much later in the 80s when we actually have a labor movement and then and then kind of student movement when you know those movements all get together very kind of left wing and kind of radical ideas actually kind of you know spring up in the 80s when we actually have all these kind of uh, demonstrations and student demonstration union demonstration and that's actually when it's really mobilized but in 70s it's still it is actually quite early in korea in in kind of a right out kind of responses to that Question for you, Yuna, while we have the, to what extent were the kitchen design appliances in Korea looking to precedents from the US or Japan during the 1960s and 70s? Mm. Uh, <laughs> it's actually uh, unofficially when I was interviewing, I interviewed a couple of people who worked with the Hansen and then designers and they were saying uh, the 60s, uh, 60s is really, you know, they didn't really have much of design concept in 60s. And so it was more of actually kind of putting the cabinets together. And 70s, it's when Hansem and, and also the Oripio become later and called the NX. And then they are setting up those uh, kitchen design companies and appliances company. And then, then uh, the, the guys who set up are actually designers and architects. And then they frequently used to go to the fairs in Europe and America. So unofficially, some people are saying it was very, very kind of a, you know, the design influence is actually quite strong coming from US and in Japan. And no one really, I mean, I guess no one really wanted to confirm it, but you know, you can actually confirm it actually by looking at some of the design materials. Like if you look at the rice cookers actually, because the rice cookers, uh, first rice cookers uh, kind of invented and designed by, manufactured by a Japanese company called, uh, and then that is actually brought in Korea and then sold in Korea under the kind of a Korean license. 
And so those designs actually, we, if, when I look at them, and they are actually very similar in terms of actually the patterns and designs and shapes and things like that. So there's very strong kind of a, kind of resemblance between those products in the very early period in the like the 70s, at six, late 60s and 70s. And I think Korea, and then Korea become actually, uh, Korea started developing their own kind of a products and design towards the end of 80s and then become much more confident about their manufacturing and design kind of ability, the kind of capacity. And then, and then things change from 90s quite significantly, but in the 60s and 70s, it will be, you know, I would say actually the design influence is very strong from our side. And in the Irish context, they are almost exclusively imported from Britain or from Europe. So you've mm. got manufacturers like um, Electrolux, Brown, who are importing into Ireland and American manufacturers are importing through British subsidiaries. So mm. they're, it's the same as the, mm. it's considered a subset of the British market yeah. in those terms, except for there's two companies that were actually manufacturing appliances in Ireland but both of which there's uh, AET and um, FAM, mm. but FAM was actually, everything was actually a subsidiary of a Dutch company. And then the other one was an Irish company, but they were um, manufacturing GEC appliances as well as their own designs. But mm. I haven't found it's, you know, it's tiny, mm. tiny yeah. in comparison. An interesting one here. Um, um just in terms of the diets of the two countries, might you tell us about the cookbooks produced by the companies manufacturing these appliances? Did they also make lo mix local, traditional, and modern cosmopolitan recipes and cooking strategies? Okay, Yuna, can you take that one first while I just get something? That's an amazing question, but I do not actually know any cookbook they produce. I haven't come across anything by these companies manufacturing the appliances. So I will actually have to go and investigate. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. And that's yeah. such a good idea. <clears throat> so I have an example I have, first. <laughs> I have an example here of the classic Irish cookbook, which is Full and Plenty, uh, written by Maura Laverty. And it's a fascinating piece because it is entirely... Um, it's written by Maura Laverty, who wrote television programs. She was a broadcaster, she uh, journalist as well. But it's all framed in stories about her home area. And it starts with like the Ballad of an Irish wheat field. Um, and it's all about, you know, stories about her neighbors, stories about um, the local area, um, various people's specific recipes, this sort of thing. Um, so it's very much this framing of both traditional recipes for you know things like baking for example um but with it something that you would find across the world so there's you know how to buy and cook fish um how do you make pastry you know it's quite cross european pan european like that but also it's got this very specific set of um framing that is very Irish. And there's actually a section in it called French cooking made easy. Mm. Alongside traditional Irish recipes. Oh. That's, that's our, uh, of course, that is on display as well in the exhibition there. Um, Anya McGuire has a question for us. Just wondering about the importance of traditional culinary culture in Korea at a government level and how this might have influenced the shape of Korean kitchen. Traditional culinary culture in Korea, and that's a really good question. And I think it might, it probably in seven. I mean, it's very, it is considered to be very important now. So Korean government to uh, strategically promote Korean food as a part of actually this Korean, whatever you you have a K and then K culture and K music, K you know film, and then K food is one of those. But in the 60s and 70s, there hasn't, as far as I know, there hasn't any really particular government initiative or you know, government awareness kind of promotion about this Korean culinary culture. But the traditional kind of 
kind of colonial culture in Korea is actually it does actually have a lot of impact on how people use kitchen even nowadays in a you know certain families so the one of the things I couldn't actually discuss was actually the ways in which when the because the, in a traditional kitchen actually the, the the some of the activities in terms of making fermented actually the, the kimchi in Korea is required a, a kind of a more or less collective cooking so be, so it's a big kind of a kind of gathering and many people get together and then and then fermented and it takes a long time it's kind of takes all day so those things were happening in the communal area in the kind of a you know in the in the courtyard of the house in the uh, con, uh, then now is actually moving to living in a house where you know virtually the outdoor space is you know known is a kind of a very limited spaces for the outdoor spaces so you actually have to think about how you can shift those things within indoor kind of a limited areas of the kitchen where particularly you're living in an apartment so there's another one just people are using actually in an apartment we in often in korea you have this uh, kind of a veranda which is right next to kitchen which is actually where you have a draining going down straight away so you have a drainage in there so you can use water and then kind of throw it to the to the floor so it's more or less a half outside area because it has a drainage there. And then so people are using those spaces as a part of the kind of kitchen, kind of half out, half indoor spaces in order to carry out some of those traditional kind of, kind of, kind of cooking, which require that kind of activities. And then- that's a, Sorry, that's something that you couldn't do in Ireland because of the weather, it just rains mm -hmm. too much. Yeah, I mean, it happens in November. You know, November is very cold in Korea, just before winter, but, you know, people do that for a day. And the other things actually happening is actually the people's habits have changed. So people are now actually buying gimchis more than making it. So now we, what we have is in pretty much most of the Korean household has something called timche, which is a kimchi fridge. So you have a fridge actually kind of a refrigerator developed specifically to keep kimchi fresh for a long period of time. And so that is something every, more or less most of the household has it if they have space. So well, and it's some, okay. And because Anya was saying that she would consider Irish culinary culture that it wasn't, mm -hmm. cons wasn't considered an important element of heritage at state level. I don't think it was, but I think it, where it did end up being promoted would, would be part of tour, the development tourist industry that you have things like the B&B &B sector kicking off in this time period and this whole idea of going and staying in somebody's house and they're actually talking to you and you're cooking their they're cooking your food for you and it's all very small and intimate that mm. that's part of it although that's probably you know quite centered around the fried breakfast particularly mm -hmm. um but I think it's where you get, it's much later that it becomes part of her, sort of mm. any consi heritage considerations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a comment from earlier from Barbara Penner was um, uh, that what she had in mind, in fact, was the, that home economics as a discipline went in sharp decline at this stage. This is from an earlier conversation, at least in North America, due in part to the hostility of feminists, who widely discredited. Uh, Jane Hattrick has a comment in there uh, from Christine <clears throat> Boydell's work on mid 20th century horrocks. You should uh, correct me on that. House coats for middle class women might be useful when thinking about the home where worn by Korean women, simultaneously glamorous and domestic. The manufacturers are seeking to reinforce the association of domesticity with femininity during mm. a period of instability and change for women. Mm. I mean, you know, Jane, I was thinking exactly the same thing when I was looking at those uh, photographs and I'll have to probably show you some other photographs of women wearing homeware. There are some really quite hilarious ones in there, but some of them are really, really gl glamorous too. Yeah. You know, the question is, is there much known about modern kitchen design in North Korea? Hmm. Uh, I don't actually really know much about actually modern kitchen design in North Korea. And I don't, I mean... I'm sure I'll be, if I try, I'll be able to access some of the document, but uh, the, I think that was actually the, the, the kind of the, those issues about case modernism actually wanted to deliberate women from the kitchen. And then as a comrade, actually they are, uh, 
they are communist comrades, they are contributing to the society rather than actually kind of slaving themselves in the kitchen. So, so that was uh, the, I know that was the kind of very beginning of 1950s, but I do not know actually what happened afterwards. So I will, that is another point I will take up on board. Oh. Portia, you comment on that? North Korea? Yeah. No. Okay, you're, flagging, <laughs> you're flagging here that you're keen to speak, so. Oh, am I? Sorry, not on purpose. <laughs> I was, uh, that's uh, more homework for you too, Sergio. Uh, uh, I wonder about the design of refrigerators, another question, and have these been modified according to Korean culinary culture? Modern, uh, the design, design of fridges, refrigerators have they been modified? Uh, design yeah. of uh, refrigerators? Mm -hmm. uh, the the one that there is a kind of you know completely new product is actually what i said about kimchi refrigerator oh. and that is something uh completely new product in and in terms of modifying it and um, i don't think that has been much modification in a different ways actually i think it, you know the most of the cases we were you know kind of very similar to what was developed, I think, mostly in America. I mean, what I've actually, you know, kind of, in, in terms of it comparing to Europe, freeze is actually, in Korean freeze is very much actually style of American freeze, I have to say, because it has a uh, kind of a, you know, it follows those kind of American uh, freeze style. So it, it has a big uh, freeze, freeze, freeze you no, know, small freezer department, then big refrigeration. And then we get those kind of uh, introduction of those kind of uh, very expensive fancy ones like a whirlpool kind of uh, introduced with all the ice machines and all the uh, and then drinking comes up from the you can have the water from outside and that kind of stuff actually then you will actually open the doors and you know kind of a uh, both size so you would have a tall kind of fridge and freezer and those ones actually comes in about 1990s and but other than that, I don't think we actually had any particular, I mean, there is some uh, kind of uh, articles about actually it's surface design. So Korean refrigerators actually have a quite decorative surface design, particularly some of them are kind of promoted by LG and Samsung actually, and they particularly sell well in Korean market. And so those ones are kind of modification made in terms of actually look of it but in terms actually kind of how it is organized inside i don't really see much differences as far as i know yeah well, excellent uh, we have that's all questions dealt with which is great um i think it's a good time to thank sorsh and yuna for very interesting presentations and talks uh for the first session of the symposium uh, just and uh, People still with us there. Uh, we do have the second session, uh, which will be on this afternoon, 3 p.m. Irish time. So there's still registration time for that as well. And uh, we have two more sessions tomorrow as part of the symposium, which will be dealing with uh, domesticity and design in Belgium and Scandinavia, science and modernity in West Germany and the United States, and women and education in Canada and Spain. Have we more coming in? All thank yous. That's great. Thank you. Happy customers. So I'm certainly looking forward to them and I hope you'd all join me as well. Um, so I think we will leave it for that and I hope to see you all in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.